God, if there's anything that I can say this morning that would be twisted by sin, let it fall on the ears of these people like a seed on rocky soil. Be quickly swept away that it would not take root and bear rotten fruit. But if there's anything I can say this morning, O oh God, that would let your love be known, may it fall upon their ears like a seed in fertile soil. May its roots grow deep and its fruits grow sweet, that it would bear in them a new life in Jesus Christ. Therefore, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Satire is a form of literature designed to highlight the absurdities and flaws of individuals, society, government, or other institutions in order to call them to question, to, to inspire scrutiny, to encourage evaluation and discourage blind acceptance of what is. While often humorous, Satire's aim is never just to get laughs, but to provide social commentary and constructive social criticism. Evan Gottlieb, the professor of British literature at Oregon State University, adds an important characteristic to successful satire. Satire depends on the audience recognizing it as such. For satire to be effective, it must be received as satire. There's always a risk that the satire will be read straight or superficially. In order to fully appreciate and appropriately interpret today's scripture lessons, we need to understand the two satires on which today's passages depend. Right, Gottlieb also teaches that satire must take aim at a target that is larger or more powerful than the author. Otherwise, instead of satire, we have mere cruelty or bullying. And I can think of no larger target for the Israelites in exile following the destruction of Judah than the Babylonian Empire. Nor could there be a larger target for a radical rabbi seeking to unmask the corruption of the Jerusalem temple than the institution of economic and political power in which it had become enmeshed, the Roman Empire. The procession of Jesus into Jerusalem, riding on the back of a donkey as crowds threw cloaks and palm branches across the road, is not a demonstration of his majesty and dominance, but rather a satire of the Roman Empire and the grand triumphal procession of the emperor and his army following victory in battle. They would parade through the streets of the city as a show of dominance and intimidation. Jesus rides in with no army, no prisoners in tow, no carts overflowing with the spoils of war. He doesn't even own the beast he rides on. And even then, he doesn't ask his disciples to borrow a horse for him to ride, but rather an ass. When Jesus arrived at the Jerusalem temple, he was immediately accosted by the chief priests and elders for the challenging questions he had been raising about their faith. Right, when Jesus uses that line, if you've got eyes, see, he's often emphasizing the satirical nature of his own parables, designed to question the authority of the empire and those whose faith had become unknowingly subservient to it. The legalistic interpretation of Torah, along with strict expectations of piety and obedience overseen by the chief priests and elders became less a tool for empowering people and bringing them to God and more a tool for keeping them in line and keeping them from God, which the Roman Empire didn't mind. 
Jesus did not reject the Torah, teaches the 20th century theologian Walter Wink, but only the way it was construed by religious authorities whose power base was in Jerusalem and who produced the readings of the Torah that perpetuated domination by Jerusalem elites and the foreign overlords with whom they collaborated at the expense of the small peasant farmers, the artisans, the assorted rural poor among whom Jesus moved. So much of Jesus' ministry and message was satirical exhortations against the Roman Empire and a corrupted temple system. His critiques can thus be seen not as an explicit condemnation of Judaism, but as an expansive critique of any form of spiritual degeneracy that becomes coupled with an institution of great economic and political power including the very institution that bears his name. Jesus' teachings and parables about the kingdom of heaven were not merely lessons about some realm of God that exists in alternate time and space. They were often direct critiques of the powers that be. And the powers that be don't like being challenged. It is utterly predictable, writes Wink in his book, engaging the powers, discernment and resistance in a world of domination, that the religious authorities will react decisively and, if necessary, murderously to maintain their wealth and power. And that murderous reaction is precisely what we see in today's passage. Given the decision to release Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Barabbas, the crowds choose Barabbas, who Matthew merely describes to us as being notorious, which, as Douglas Hare elaborates, really means that his exploits were well known. The crowds knew why he had been arrested. He had been willing to fight against the Roman authorities on behalf of the people. That's why he was arrested. The crowd is offered a poignant choice, remarks Hare, which Jesus do they want, right? The one who will strive to save them with his sword or the one who will give his life for their sins. Their resounding choice indicates that they, too, were not quite fully aware of the subtleties of scriptural satire that he had exposed. And they expected the Messiah to be a literal king and savior. And now this brings us to the second, and I would say foundational, satire on which all of Judeo's scriptures are built, Judeo-Christian scriptures, which is the reign of a liberating God, who chooses as his own an oppressed people and champions the small. This is a direct satire of what Walter Wink terms the domination system. More specifically, scripture as satire began as a means of self-empowerment by a community of displaced people seeking to survive exile and oppression by asserting their faith in something greater than the systemic violence and exploitation of their captors. Much of Hebrew scripture are attempts by the Israelite community to resist and reject the mythology endorsing the violence and domination of the Babylonian Empire. The Enuma Elish is the creation epic of the Babylonian Empire, and I will let Walter Wink summarize it for you. In the beginning, according to this myth, Apsu and Tiamat, the sweet and saltwater oceans, bear Mumu, the mist. And from them also issue the younger gods, whose frolicking makes so much noise that the elder gods cannot sleep and resolve to kill them. This plot of the elder gods is discovered, and A kills Apsu and his wife Tiamat pledges revenge. So A and the younger gods, in terror, turn for salvation to their youngest Marduk. 
He exacts a steep price, right? If he succeeds, he must be given chief and undisputable power in the assembly of the gods. Having extorted this promise, he catches Tiamat in a net, drives an evil wind down her throat, and then shoots an arrow that bursts her distended belly and pierces her heart. He then splits her skull with a club and scatters her blood in out-of-the-way places. He stretches her corpse to full length and from it creates the cosmos. Mm, beautiful. The Hebrew creation myth in Genesis 1 was never intended to be a history of how it really happened, but was a direct satirical commentary on the myth that fueled the violence of the culture by which they were being oppressed. The use of water and wind and word in the Genesis account directly counter the Babylonian assumption that violence is simply the way that things has always been. Creation is not an act of violence, they say. It is an expression of love. Order is not brought into the watery chaos by means of war and domination, but by the spoken word of God. And the wind or spirit or breath of God is not an instrument of death, but life. The prophetic work of 2nd Isaiah from which this morning's passage comes, was from the same era of exile. And his prophecy makes use of this satire to strengthen and stimulate his hearers. As Paul Hansen writes in his commentary on 2 Isaiah, the author of Isaiah 40 through 55 set himself the task of countering the ideology of power presented in the creation epic of the Babylonian Empire. And he was doing this as an exile, surrounded by the authorities and power structures of the Babylonian Empire. As you can imagine, the prophet's challenge of the powers and principalities of Babylon did not earn him any gold stars for good behavior. In today's passage, he suggests that he has been arrested and imprisoned by the authorities and for that reason discredited in the eyes of many of his fellow exiles. And if the one who identified himself as a servant of Yahweh and spoke out against the powers that be was arrested and put to shame by those same powers was not the authority and power of Yahweh also at risk of being discredited. Isaiah did not seem to be in control of the situation at all. But the power of Yahweh is different from the brand of power the world is familiar with. God is not interested in violence or having control over human beings. The God revealed in Scripture is a God who sets the oppressed free who brings release to the captive, who frees the slaves from Egypt, who topples the thrones of the mighty and haughty, who demands that the socially vulnerable be looked after, the foreigner who resides among you, the orphans and the widows in your midst. God's power is not proven by a manifestation of exploitation, but by a manifestation of compassion. A revelation of this power over and against the powers of a domination system is going to cause some friction. But Isaiah does not fear this. But he points to the violence he faces as an indication of the fear and foible of his adversaries. Isaiah, just as Jesus demonstrated in his own message and ministry, does not need to fight who will declare me guilty? Those who insult and injure and spit in the face of prophets simply seeking to expose the corruption of the dominating culture and empower the marginalized? Who will declare me guilty? Those who claim God is on their side as they persist in hating their enemies? Those whose hosannas crumble to cries for crucifixion within five days? Those who use their understanding of Jesus to make cruel jokes at others' expense? 
Those who claim their faith makes them better than anyone else. They have missed the point. Those who carry the banner of Jesus into war or violent protest carry the banner of Barabbas, not the Christ. Let us not lose sight of why we shout Hosanna as Jesus approaches. We are satirizing the systems and structures of sin that still dominate the world. We are voicing our opposition to the violence and cruelty of the powers that be. We are mocking the mighty whose strength extends only as far as their sword. And we are empowering the marginalized whose value is inherent to their being, not to their usefulness. May we shout Hosanna as emissaries of God's love in the midst of a world of violence and hate. May we shout Hosanna with the expectancy that love will win out over all the other powers, even the power of death. And I don't want to spoil the ending, but do play close attention to how the story of Jesus unfolds this week.